So many times it, it seems like people have to muster everything they have in them just to be able to praise the Lord. When we ought to be in that place where we can't help ourselves but praise the Lord. You know, it just, it wants to come out. It wants to flow from us. And when it gets to that point, that's when you know the joy of the Lord is in you. And the joy of the Lord is your strength, the scripture says. Praise the Lord. It is good to have each and every one of you with us this morning. And uh, we pray that God will bless you in this service. Uh, it's good to have those that are visiting with us. And we pray that you will be blessed uh, by the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Precious Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We serve a great God. And there, uh, as I said, there's nothing Amen. that he can't do. Amen. Amen. There's nothing that he can't do. Um, and we just ask God that he would move on, uh, on behalf of every single person in here. Amen. There's a lot of people who are just so much stuff is out there and so many, much fear is being, is being propagated uh, throughout the media and throughout uh, just this, this world. And it's a shame. And, uh, and I know there's things that we need to be cautious on, but we don't need to be afraid of. Amen. There's a difference Amen. between being cautious and being afraid. And there's a big difference. Amen. One causes you to be paralyzed and you're not able to do anything. The other just causes you to have wisdom in what you do. Amen. And we Amen. need to know the difference. We need to understand the difference between those. And know that God wants us to be wise, but he doesn't want us to be paralyzed. Amen. 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 Do you believe that? Come on. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we're going to go ahead and receive our tithe and offerings for this morning. We do appreciate all that you give. We're living in some extraordinary times. Extraordinary times. And the church needs the power of God more now than it's ever needed before. It does. It needs the power of God more now than it ever has before. Because the powers of the enemy are coming against the church. They're coming against our nation, our world. And, uh, and we need to be praying. We need to be not just speaking words. But we need to be praying with power. Yeah. Power. Yeah, that God will break the stronghold of the enemy. Yeah. And that he will take and do what needs to be done in this trying time. And he's more than capable of doing it. Amen? Amen? He's more than capable of doing that. The past few weeks we have been on a series called Jehovah Jireh. And the first we had looked at, and I had just made a circle here. And, and uh, you know, the, the first one up here, it talks about Abraham being led to Canaan by the Lord. God met Abram and and told him that he was going to lead him to a different land to leave his home, leave his home uh, folk and go to this land. Then we see that God again meets with Abraham and he tells him to go to Mount Moriah and to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And then we see that Joseph, after this we see time going by and then sometime down the road we see hundreds of years later Joseph is led to Egypt. It seems like Egypt is a place where it's always kind of in the mix with Israel. And uh, so we see Joseph being led to Egypt because he was sold into slavery. But he was led there by God so that he could rescue his people in time of famine. And then we see from there, we see that Moses has to lead them out. So we see the place, Mount Moriah, we see the uh, path. That Moses takes through the wilderness and into the promised land. We see next that the Israel rebels while they're in the promised land. Then we see the plans of God where the Jews are exiled into Babylon. And then God takes them out of Babylon and brings them back into the promised land. So in the last three sermons we saw the plan. We saw the path. Or we saw the place, the path, and the plans that God had. Abraham, the Bible says in Genesis twenty-two fourteen, 14, Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. 
as it is said to this day, in the mouth of the Lord, it shall be provided. In Isaiah 43, 19, we read, I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Then in Jeremiah 29, 11, we saw God say, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Then in Genesis 22, 8, Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb. So today we will see that God wonderfully, miraculously, and divinely provides the lamb for himself. That God provides the lamb. As Abraham said it would be way hundreds and hundreds of years before, we will see that God did just that. In 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, in our text it says, It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but he has now revealed him to you in these last days. The title is, God Will Provide. God will provide. We saw that God has a place where he will be seen. We saw that God had a path that he would make a way. We also saw that God has plans for us. Today we see that God will provide. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, your word, Lord God, is powerful and it's strong and it's able to cut even to the very marrow of our bone. Lord, it's able to enter in, Lord God, and to do the work that it needs to be done in the very soul and spirit of man. So we ask, Lord, today, Lord God, that your word will cut in, Lord God, and that it will make whatever needs to be done, Lord, done in our lives. Father, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for the, the place, Lord. Thank you for the path. Thank you for the plans that you have for us, Lord. But so much we thank you for the provisions that you have provided. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. The provision. Provision. The word provision, I, I looked it up in, uh, on the ethnology uh, uh, site. And they have a place where you can look up on the web uh, the origin of words, where they came from and all. And this word provision means a providing beforehand. Okay, we think of providing as, okay, I'll go to the store and I'll, I'll bring somebody something because I know they need it, right? Well, provision means providing beforehand. It's action of arranging in advance. It, it was originally used in reference to ecclesiastical appointments. So, you know, the, the church would appoint somebody to a place before that place was vacant. Before that person left, they would already be preparing for that person to leave. So they would get somebody ready to take that place. So that's where we get the word provision from. It comes from the Latin word provisionum, and it means foreseeing, foresight, preparation, or prevention. It comes from the root word, which means looking ahead, looking ahead. Okay, so it's not just that God looks down and says, oh, they have need of something. I will provide it for them. No, he already knows beforehand that you have need of something, and he has already provided for us. Do you get that? See, you say, I don't know if God will provide. Well, God already knows that you have need, and he's already made the way for you to have that need met if you'll just believe by faith. See, we don't think of it that way today as they do in the past. When we talk about provision, we, we don't think of it the way as they did. In, in the past, they had to make provision for the winter, right? So what did they do? They stored up when they took the crops. They stored up their provisions. They stored up crops. They canned food. They took and, and, and took meat and sodded it and put it away. Why? Because they knew in the wintertime they weren't going to be able to do those things. So they made provision for themselves ahead of time. 
That's exactly what this is saying about God. God makes provisions beforehand for us. Beforehand. In 1 Peter 1.20, the scripture said, God chose him, speaking of Christ, as your ransom long before the world began. Sacrifice was made at the foundation of the world. Can you imagine that before God even created the world, before he created Adam and Eve, the counsels of God, him, the Son, the Holy Spirit in counsel decided that man, as he created him, was going to sin and that that sin would need to be taken care of before the devil was going to hijack us and take us hostage by sin. God knew about it and already made provision for that for us. Do you get that? You say, I don't know if God will save me. The Bible says that he made provision for you at the foundation of the world before the world began. Yeah. God made provision for every single person in the world to have some way of coming back to him. Before it all happened, before anything took place, God made provision for you and I. Jesus Himself, when speaking to the, the people and the Pharisees and all around him, they were arguing with him. And, and he was talking about knowing Abraham. And, and, he, and they said, how could you know Abraham? And he, because he said, your father, Abraham, rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. Abraham, when he was on Mount Moriah, when he called that place Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord will be seen, or the place where the Lord will be seen, or the place where the Lord will see to it, or the place where God will provide, saw Christ ahead of time. Now, in some, you know, some uh, commentaries, they believe that the, people, the, the angels that came down to Abraham was talking to him about Sodom and Gomorrah when he said they were going to destroy it. One of those was the, the, incar uh, the, the uh, uh, Christ coming down before his incarnation. So, you know, he, he was thinking that Abraham knew ahead of time. See, when he said the Lord will provide, he understood what was going to happen. Somehow God let him see this and the, the Pharisees well how could you know Abraham lived long before you and Jesus said before Abraham was I am before Abraham was I am that means I've been around all the time I've been around before Abraham so yes Abraham could see me because I was around when he was around amen in John 1, 29, we read, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we see that the, the people of Israel were led back from the exile into uh, Israel once again. They were into Judah and into Jerusalem. And they stayed there, but they, you know, they went through all kinds of different battles. The Roman soldiers came and destroyed the temple. They took over. They were uh, set up on uh, camp there. They made Herod the king of the Jews. All this stuff happened in the 400 years that we don't know about between the Old Testament and the New Testament. God was preparing the way for Christ to come onto the scene. See, God picked the perfect time. God picked the per perfect place because God knew what would need to be done in order to have his message brought out to everybody. The Romans were the ones that came, set up the road system. They built roads. They built bridges. They built all kinds of things. They set it up so it would be easy for the missionaries in that first, uh, first church to be able to move around the country and tell people about Jesus. They set it all up. They set the stage. God allowed all that to take place in order for Christ to be able to come in on the scene. And that's exactly what happened. There came a time 
when Jesus entered into the world. And John was looking for him. He knew that he was going to be there. And when Jesus came, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. Jesus Christ takes away every sin. Yeah. Amen. All sin, Jesus Christ takes away. He is that Lamb that God provided. He is that Lamb. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says this. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. God sent Jesus Christ into the world to be our sacrifice. That's the reason he came. As Christians, I think we waste the very sacrifice that God gave. I really do. Because I, I think we take for granted what he's done too much. I mean, if somebody in, in the natural, I mean, if somebody in the natural, you were in a situation where your life was in danger and somebody jumped in and rescued you or saved you or pulled you out and gave their life for you, you didn't die, but they did. Your life wasn't taken. Theirs was. Would you act the same way as so many Christians act today about Christ who gave his life for us? Would you? Would you just say, eh, that's fine. And you think about maybe once in a great while? Huh? Would you not, you know, contact their family? Would you not Talk about them to your friends. Wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you say, man, do you know so-and-so? I, I was just about ready to get hit by a car, and they ran out in the street and pushed me out of the way. And the car ran over them and killed them. But I was saved. Would you keep that quiet? Would you not tell somebody? Huh? But so many times... Christians just don't do that today. We hold it in. We, we just hold it to ourselves. We don't tell somebody that Jesus Christ died Amen. for me. Amen. The Bible says that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. While I was his enemy, he still died for me. When I spoke bad about him, when I used his name in vain, or when I took and just did anything I wanted, it didn't matter because he saw me and he still said, that person needs salvation. He's going to need it. Frank Hudson needs me and I'm going to die on the cross for him. I'm going to give my life up for him. Hallelujah. That's why it's important for us to tell. I want to tell people he died for me. Jesus Christ died for my sins. It was my sins that was going to cause me to die and to die a horrible death and go to hell. But Jesus Christ died in my place. Amen. God sent his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. You know, so many people are so hung up on what they have to do once they get saved. Don't get hung up on that. You know, if you love God enough, you'll do whatever you need to do. You will have, don't do what people say you need to do. Do what God says you need to do. Amen? Do what God says you need to do. But don't get hung up on what you have to do. Be hung up on the fact that God sent his son to die for you. He gave his life for you. When you look at that person lying in the street that just got ran over by a car and his blood is pouring down the street, you know that that lifeblood is pouring out for you. It gave you life. And when we look to the cross and we see the blood, the lifeblood of Jesus Christ pouring out of him, we know that he gave his life for us. Amen. He gave his life for us. Amen. 
Do we understand that? Do we get a, a clear picture of that? Does it make us feel it inside? Do we know it beyond a shadow of doubt? Does it make us hungry? Does it make us uh, uh, just have, like Jeremiah said, like a fire shut up in our bones that we can't not tell people? I want to tell people over and over again about it. I was, my cousin, he passed away. He was, he, his kidneys had given up on him. They had failed him. He's been on dialysis for, I guess, almost two years now. Been doing five hours a day, almost every day for the past year. And he was on a waiting list. He couldn't get a kidney. He wouldn't let the family take and do anything. And then finally, three months ago or so, he said, he said, anybody in the family that wants to try to give me a kidney, I would appreciate it. I started going through the process of doing that. I started going through the process, get filled out all the paperwork, going through the interview, uh, talked on the phone to the interview, went, got my blood work done, got all that done. I was waiting on the results from it when he went for the worse and, and passed away. My point is this though, not about me, but that just that, okay, just that. My cousin's wife and my cousin's brother, Barry, he, they've been telling everybody. They call me a hero, call me all this stuff. I just went through the process. I didn't even get to do it. But they're telling everybody about what I was going to do, what I was in the process of trying to do. And they're telling everybody. I didn't do nothing. I was just going through the process. Jesus Christ did something. He yeah. died. Yeah. He did something. Amen. And why aren't we telling everybody yeah. that he is our hero, yeah. that he is our sacrifice, that he died on the cross, that he did this for us? Why don't we tell people? I mean, I, I said I did nothing, and Christ did everything. God showed him how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world. In 1 Peter 1, 9 and 19 in our text said, it was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, he did nothing wrong, the spotless, the pure, the holy Lamb of God. That's who he gave up. Me, I'm, I'm fault, you know, I have faults, I'm not perfect, I'm not, I'm not nothing compared to him. He didn't deserve to die on the cross, but he did. He didn't deserve to die, but he did. In Romans 4, 25, it says, he hand, was handed over, Christ was handed over to die because of our sins. If we had not sinned, he would not have had to die. See? If we had not sinned, he would not have lived. You say, well, I, I'm a good person. I haven't really sinned. No, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Adam sinned, and from sin, Adam sinned, all have sinned. But then it says, by one Christ, Jesus came, and he lifts the sin. He gets rid of the sin. Right? Adam brought sin into the world. Christ comes to redeem us from sin. He was handed to, over to die because of our sins, and he was raised up. See, he didn't just stay dead. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a risen Savior. He rose from the dead. Why? To give us life and make us right before God or with God. Christ died and rose again so that we could stand righteous before God. Before God. It's nothing that you have done. It's nothing that I have done. If you're waiting till you can get it right, you'll be waiting till you die. Because we can't get it right. If we had the power to get it right, God wouldn't have sent his son to die. Right? If we had the power to get it right, God wouldn't have sent his son. But he sent his son because we were powerless. We were incapable of of making ourselves right before God. 
Acts 8.32 says he was like a sheep that was led to the slaughter. A lamb is solemn before the shears. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't cry, God, Father, send 10,000 angels and take me off this cross. He didn't on the cross say, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. Today we got a lot of people trying to blame everybody else. Jesus didn't open his mouth to blame anybody. He didn't say, I blame you, Frank Hudson, for taking and having me on this cross. It's your fault that I'm on this cross. He didn't say that. And he didn't say it about any one of you either. The Bible says he kept his mouth shut. That doesn't mean he didn't say anything. But he didn't roll out any accusations of blame. Okay? Which brings us back to the slide again, if you would. Give me that slide. Now, I took out the two because we see the path that Abraham and the people of Israel went. But after they were brought back into the promised land, the provision was made. Promises were fulfilled. Christ was born. Christ was ministry. People rejected him. And then he went to Calvary, to Golgotha, which is the exact same place that Abraham offered up Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham said that this is the place that the Lord will be seen, where he will see to it, that he will provide. Abraham, as a prophet, spoke of the time when Christ would be offered up in the same place as his son was. And God provided the lamb as he did for Abraham. Amen? Amen. Abraham showed himself faithful to God by offering up his son, and God showed himself faithful to us by offering up his only son. God will be faithful. And all that he says he will do, he will do it. Romans 8.32 says, since he did not spare even his own son, since he didn't even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? You say, well, I don't know if God will heal. Well, he gave up his son. Don't you think he would heal? I don't know if God can supply my needs. If he gave up his son, don't you think he could supply your needs? If he was able to prepare and get that all in place to have his son die in the exact same place where Abraham offered up his son, the circle went completely around and right back to that spot. If he was able to do that, don't you think that he knows everything that's going on in your life? Not just the hairs on your head, like the Bible says, but he knows every need that you have. He knows every need that you will have. He knows every trial that you will go through. He knows every um, suffering that you will have to face. He knows all of that. He knows all of it. And he is already prepared if you'll just look to him for the help. If we will look to him for the help, he's there to give it to us. We just got to look to him. We need to reach out to him. If he would give his only son, won't he give us everything else? He gave us the best. Amen. Wouldn't he give us everything less? If he gave the best, won't he give you everything else underneath that? Well, come on. If I gave you a million dollars, said, you know what? Gloria, here's a million dollars for you. Well, I just feel like you need it. And down the road, for whatever reason, you say, yeah, oh, man, I need 10 bucks. You don't think I'd give you 10 bucks if I gave you a million dollars? Now I may wonder where you put that million dollars. <laughs> 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 but the fact is this, that if he gave us the best and the, the most that he had, don't you think he would give us everything else that we need? And he was more than capable of doing so. In just a moment, we're going to take communion. And it's open to everybody who knows Christ as Savior. You're able to take it if you know him as your Savior.
I have a slide. Put that last slide up there if you would, brother. You want to, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. There is none. Christ had to die. It was just that. There had to be someone pure and righteous. Someone without sin that was spotless. Just like the lambs had to be spotless and pure. There had to be somebody. Abraham understood that Isaac was not the perfect sacrifice. He knew that. Isaac would not have done anything because he wasn't pure. But he knew that God would provide. And God made provision. Hundreds of years later, hundreds of years later, you say, man, God's taking too long. Well, think about the Israels. They, Israelites, they had to wait hundreds of years to get there. But God provided Christ. Stand with me if you would just for a moment. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. If you're among the crowd that believes that the Bible, all the, the references to the blood should be taken out of the Bible, then you're taking away the very fact that our sins were cleansed by the blood. It was by the blood of Jesus Christ that we are cleansed from our sin. The blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood that was shed, the blood that was poured out all along the way, there would be no remission of sins. We would all be standing before God as his enemy instead of as his friend. Isaac asked Abraham, where is the lamb? Father, where is the lamb? Abraham answered, God will provide himself. A lamb. We saw the place, we saw the path, we saw the plans and the provision. But one day we're going to hear the praise. Revelation 5 11 through 13 says, Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus. Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessings. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. They sang blessing and honor, glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. One day we're going to hear that praise. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, if you believe that he is the Lamb. That was sacrificed for your sins. You will listen to that heavenly chorus. You will hear the angels cry out. And thousands upon thousands will cry out. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. 